Welcome to Chess on Toast's Game of the Day. We're looking at round three today of the London FIDE Candidates Tournament 2013. My name's Nick Murphy. With me, as always, Lauren DaCosta. So, Lauren, you've seen the games in round three. What are we going to look at today? In this game, we're going to look at the world number one and favourite for the tournament, Magnus Carlsen, who secured his first win in fine style. And here he played black against uh, the vice world champion of the world, if you like to call him that, which is Boris Gelfand. Obviously, Boris, a very strong player, and uh, he doesn't normally lose many games with white, even against the top players. So here we're going to see how Carlsen did just that. Boris was the recent, he was the world championship uh, com contender, wasn't he, against Anand in the recent world championship That's right, match. last year, and he was very close to becoming world champion himself. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, obviously a good player. Okay. So the game started with d4, this is uh, Boris's favourite move. And position, positions tend to be quite closed with this compared to the normal advance of e4. So Carlsen responded with knight f6, and that prevents, of course, e4. Fairly standard so far. Yep. c4, the queen's gambit, and black played e6. So white now played uh, knight f3, and this is called the queen's Indian, uh, if black were now to play the move pawn to b6. So again... Black's idea, um, I think this is the third game in a row that we've done where it's involved with Fianchetto. Yeah. Um, Black could now, could now play bishop b7 and look towards e, e4, maybe even further. It's putting your bishop on the, uh, fianchetto your bishop, putting it on that long diagonal, it's a very popular idea, right up to the to the very top world level, isn't That's it? That's right. And the e4 square, as in pretty much every opening, is such a key square in this opening. Um, in the game after knight f3, just to say that... W White could have played knight c3 here, and this allows the Nimzo Indian, which is, I'm pretty sure Magnus would have played. This is an op one of my favourite openings, and again, it's the, the key point is, White cannot play e4, because black will actually respond knight takes e4. And the reason why is because we have a... It's a pin. It's the, a pin. The bishop is pinning the knight to the king. <clears throat> so, uh, that's the called the Nimzo Indian, and uh, that's probably what Magnus would have played. So here we saw knight f3, and Carlsen responded with d5, which is a kind of pretty much normal move but now this leads to a queen's gambit declined what I mean by that is um, earlier well it's all sort of like a transposition but basically black could have captured on c4 yeah but instead he defended his pawn on d5 with the pawn on e6 so instead of trying to win the pawn on c4 as we see here he instead just defended it now of course like we saw in the game from round two I believe the bishop on c8 doesn't really have a lot but as we'll see, um, that's not necessarily the worst thing. And in the game, Black ends up doing this kind of fianchetto idea anyway. So more of that later. So knight c3, knight bd7, mm -hmm. um, and bishop g5 here. So lots and lots of different moves. Black could have stuck to bishop e7, breaking the pin. Um, do you think that looks like a good move? Yeah, that looks fairly sensible to me. Anything, any other squares for that bishop, do you think? Um, the only other square, I would say, is back down to that b4 square. So, again, pinning the knight. But um, either looks... The only problem with that, I think, is it could easily be kicked away by moving that a3 pawn. But you could just take it. Yeah, this is kind of another variation called the Rogozin. And black actually has to play very differently to what happens uh, in this game. And black normally attacks the centre with c5 and now tries to bring the queen out to a5 and target that square. So... Yeah, lots of different plans that Black could have chosen. Carlson instead played pawn to c6, and this actually um, is, leads to another opening, quite a sort of club player's favourite, called the Cambridge Springs. Do you know anything about that at all? I don't know that one. No, that's a new one to me. Well, the pawn obviously solidifies that square, so now Black has so many pawns defending it, d5. Yeah, I mean, it looks never... like a sensible sort of um, safe move. You know, he's not sort of risking anything, he's just securing that centre pawn. That's right, but what are we going to do about this bishop on c8? Because I've just yeah, talked looks... about how Black could have played b6 and sort of bishop b7. It does look a bit squashed in. I mean, I, I guess, as you, you did mention, that maybe that idea of b6 is going to have to come now because that bishop's a bit squashed in there. Well, the Cambridge Springs actually involves another idea. Black decides not to bother with that bishop on c8 there in the green. Right. But instead is going to focus on that queen a5 idea. idea yeah. Which is to bring the queen out and sort of try and attack down here. Because the white bishop has gone to... Uh, excuse me. The white bishop has gone to g5. And therefore, it's kind of left the queen side a bit bare. I see. And therefore, yeah. Black tries to do something about that. So again, we talk we talk about this all the time. Sort of some positives, some negatives to just about every opening. That's right. I think one thing I just want to go back to the beginning, very very briefly, is to explain that if White had gone knight c three, and Black instead played d five, just going to show this as an, as yeah. an example, bishop g five, 
there's a little trick here to note, and now after knight d7, you'll see that after knight f3, e c6, we have the exact same position as what happened in the game via a different move order. But there's a little trick here, because if white now thinks he can win the pawn on d5 using that pin there, mm -hmm. can you see why that's actually a blunder? Um, it's called the elephant trap, it's quite a nice one to know. Wow, uh, you put me on the spot, and I would say... No, I don't know why that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have had this once myself when I was about 10 years old, and I just took my opponent's knight. He thought, well... Oh, you could bring... Ah, you could do a killer move now, bring out the bishop. Bishop to b4 check. And white has to now play queen d2, the only move. And in fact, after all the exchanges are done, you'll see that black emerges a piece ahead. Look, we've got three. Wow, yeah. And they've so only got two. So, basically um, a knight for a pawn. And ended up winning quite easily. And this has been seen quite a few times. <laughs> so whilst it couldn't have happened in this game, just be careful to watch the different move order here. Look, the bishop only comes to g5 now, and black plays c6. I thought it was worth showing the viewer that there was actually this trick called the elephant gambit. Just yeah, like that. it probably occurs in sort of club level games uh, relatively often, I would have thought. That's right. So now white can't try and win the pawn on d5 there in green. So instead he played e3. And here we see the idea of the Cambridge Springs. Queen a5. And especially poignant that the pawn is on e3. Because now this bishop on g5 cannot retreat right. and help out this diagonal. So what we're going to find is that there's going to be a lot of pressure on this knight. How do you think black could step up the pressure on that knight? I know it's white scope. But... Sure. I mean, uh, instantly you want to bring that knight into e4. Yeah, this is the key one, one to remember. And another idea? Another. Uh, idea. Bring the bishop out and put that back onto b4. Exactly. So there's going to be three pieces going to be attacking that knight on c3. So if white is not careful, uh, you couldn't... And I not, don't have time and all the uh, capacity to talk about that opening because that's been covered elsewhere. Sure. But suffice to say that if White now plays, I don't know, Bishop D3, he's got to be very careful because after Knight E4... He's running Black out of moves to defend well, that. Well, White now. actually has quite a lot to deal with because if I go Queen C2, which looks like a very... I mean, White, the last two moves by White are very sensible. Sure. Watch what happens here. Knight takes G5. Ow. Knight takes G5. And now we see this... Potential discovered attack. Of course, attack. you're attacking the bishop and the knight at the yeah, same just, time. So the queen doesn't actually look just down here. No. It looks towards the other direction. But you don't as think well. of that because the pawns, were, the black pawns were so solid. But of uh, course, instant, once they moved, it's it's yeah. That's right. Now, of course, Boris is never going to fall for that. <laughs> no. I mean, Carlos is not playing that to try and get that. But I think again for the club player, that's well. That's these are the tricks. All, well all the sort of stuff that you know, uh, sort of, uh, uh, we normal players might fall into. <laughs> and I use the we, not meaning you. <laughs> oh, thank you. So kind. Right. So C takes D five is um, one of the main moves. The other line is to play Knight D two, which again looks a bit weird, but it does help control the E four square, yeah. and it means that there's less pressure down towards the king. But that's not the sort of obvious move that you'd spot, is it? It, do so it doesn't look. Yeah, it doesn't look good. I mean, I can see why you'd play it, but um, it's sort of one of those moves that seems counterintuitive at first glance. So C takes D five, and uh, the one time I've ever had this, my opponent, uh, a grandmaster from Belgium, decided to take with the E pawn. But now there's no tricks with them taking on here, so I was just able to go uh, bishop d3 and queen c2, um, just get castled, and the game was kind of normal. But I think black really suffered from getting this bishop out later in the game. Yeah. So in the get in well, modern theory says that black should take with a knight. Now, that just seems to be contradictory to everything we just said. It wasn't black's idea to go knight e4? Well, black's still going to play bishop b4 and step up the pressure on the knight. Um, so white played rook c1. Um, the main line actually runs queen d2, which seems to walk into a pin, but actually white is okay here. Um, and I think black castles, bishop d3. Um, there's also another line with white actually sacrifices a pawn with a3, yeah. because black, white, excuse me, really wants to get rid of that bishop. So takes, have to take with a pawn, and then black can of course win a pawn here. And this has been seen a few times. But now we see white go e4 and bishop yep. d3 and yeah again. So you've sacrificed a pawn but you do have compensation. Yeah. yeah. So again that's for another time. So just showing the viewer all these different ideas. Um, after rook c1 though, black could of course go bishop b4. But instead he stuck, he played another idea which is knight takes c3. So what would happen if I decided to take with a rook? Nick? Uh, well you'd be, you'd be suffering from that pin idea again with the yep, bishop b4. Bishop b4. So... Again, girlfriend played the best move, B takes C3. So haven't we just gifted black a pawn now, do you think? Um, well, it, isn't it, it's probably, isn't it, the same idea again? You have now you can now move the pawn to E4 and b bring the bishop out and um, 
compensation. Yeah, I think bishop d3 followed by his short castle um, should be quite easy for white basically like this. Pawn e4, get a bit of action. And black's still struggling with this bishop. Yeah. So his de black's development really hasn't uh, hasn't got very far. So here we see Carlson decide instead just to go bishop a3. Attacking the rook, rook c2, bit awkward, but it's okay. And now uh, b6, so the idea is to finally get that bishop yeah. out. Yeah. I mean, he could go to b7, but I think this is better to exchange it off because we've always talked about how what a problem piece that bishop is. Yeah. So, so we'll see that over the next few moves. So here he decides to go there. It's basically um, offering the exchange because his bishop isn't very good, whereas white's bishop is in a better position. So. Yeah, we've got to be careful. That's not actually dangerous across there, is so, it? So you're quite happy for, for white to swap that one off. That's right. And here we see uh, Gelfan Castle. If he takes an a6, this is not as good because not only does it lose time, but it stops white castling because, as we know, you cannot castle yeah. through check onto f1. So castling, let them take you. And... Black eventually cast with a white plate e4, the pawn move in the centre. So, it, you know, Gelfand would be quite happy with this position. But as we see over the next few moves, Carlson fights back and reaches um, a kind of equal position. Let's just see what happens. Rook e8, maybe Black threatens to go e5. Yes, so, yeah. um, his pawn break. The other pawn break is, of course, to play. Uh, to play c5. To play yeah. c5. So, Black's got to be careful about one of them, but he's that's what he's trying to do. And Gelfand played e5. Well, it looks like he's. You know, gaining space, but he's got to be careful that he's not overextending. And here we see Carlson doing the exact same thing as we said there, c5. Since he can't play e5, he's gone with the c pawn instead. Sure, yeah. And this kind of manoeuvring occurred like this, where Black eventually got the last piece into the game, the rook on c8, very sensible. See, even Carlson, the best player in the world at the moment, very sensibly bringing all his pieces into the game. Yeah. You notice the top players never leave a single piece on move from their starting squares. Well, cause, funny enough, in that game we, we saw, was it yesterday, um, one of the things we noticed that, that, that there was trouble, uh, Black had real trouble getting their pieces out, and that actually, of course, caused them to lose in the end. Exactly. So, here you can see Black's really made an effort to make sure that uh, they're fully developed and they've got all their pieces working together. So here it looks as though Carson actually blundered, um, and he allowed this knight c4, because White already has a queen attacking across to a3. But Carlson had it all secure. He played queen b5, pinning white black uh, back, back. Oh, back. yeah. Um, so white could have now taken on a3 with a queen, but then black plays rook takes c4. I mean, objectively, this is probably <clears throat> roughly equal after this. I don't know, maybe the white is... I mean, you'll see this as a feature in the game, the black knight being actually better than the white bishop. Normally, it's the other way around. But here we see the knight would love to get in on the d5 square right. at some point. And uh, the bishop doesn't really have a good square anywhere. I mean, it might be good on d6. But we tend to say that knights prefer outposts more than bishops. Sure. So even if white took, black took, bishop g3, um, Carlson would still try to play, or maybe something like rook c8. So you'll see that in the game where it appears quite equal, but actually you'll find that um, black still has this niggling, well, these niggling yeah. chances to try and do something. I mean, at this level, the differences are very, very small, aren't they? So again, mm -hmm. like you're saying, it's you know for most players it would be very equal but actually these tiny tiny differences make make are actually much bigger at this level that's know? right so here white played f4 and he's just has ideas of trying to charge but carlson's rook c7 was an excellent move because now he's threatening rook c8 to attack yeah. the knight and gelfand probably you know i don't think he has time for f5 because i think um i think black's just going to be able to go there isn't he and now what do we do about this yeah if i take you take, but uh, yeah, maybe could have done this. Maybe after f5, black should actually just swap it. Um, and if queen takes here, why, can't, dangerous, we, why can't we play there? Rook takes c4. Oh, because the queen could take uh, the pawn on f7, right. and then it would be attacking that rook. And both rooks. So, oh, yeah. Uh, maybe f5, um, I haven't checked this with the computer, but it seems like the kind of idea that white should be trying to do. Um, no doubt Gil Boris had other ideas. But you can't just do it in that particular uh, no. that time. Uh, Bishop f2. So again, we're going to see his um, black playing for this better knight against uh, white bishop. So this period of manoeuvring occurred. It looks as though white's still fine. The knight retreated, but don't worry, it'll be back. A bit like Arnie. Right, g6. So again, um, black's d5 squares disappeared from the knight, but he's still got a lovely square on e6 to go to. Uh, potentially f5. Mm. What he has is also these queenside pawns against white's one pawn, and you're going to see that as the decisive factor in this game. So obviously we're looking at um, Galfan's got more pawns on the king side, but 
that's not as big of a pressure as the, the pawn advantage that Carlsen no, has. No, they're not very really mobile because White's pawns can't really move forward, which yeah. is why um, Carlsen th- actually played g6 to control the f5. The three square. black pawns are doing quite a good job of blockading the four white pawns. That's right, he'd probably go h5 actually to stop them all, which is what happened in the moment. Yeah. Um, so the pieces White maneuvered. And uh, h5, there we go. So he's basically trying to stop white getting those pawns going. The knight already stops that one. And now black can consider getting his guys forward as well. So, very uh, clever, yeah. Just um... Combining play on both sides. Very uh, very strong play. Now h4 was played, um, which feels not that great. Because now what white should have really done is considered h3. And then trying to continue yeah. that arrow sequence there. Because once he's played h4, he can't he can't really advance any of his pawns. None of his pawns are safe to move. That's right, because now, if he goes g4, black will just, just capture take it. So, um, and yeah. And now Carlsen played a good move, queen c2, because it brings the queen in and also still keeps an eye on white's f5. So combining his play with preventing the opponent's play, this is a top-level chess. Queen b7, Queen a4, and White had to retreat to defend the a3 point. Huh. And now Black just continued with b5. So Carlsen could, of course, just made a draw here with Queen c2, yeah. but he's not interested in that. No. Um, the fighting spirit should be commended here. There's a reason why he's the highest play, rated player in history. Yeah, he doesn't take draws. Um, so b5. It's a little bit risky because it did allow White to now go f5 and weaken his king. Um, don't really want to move the knight anywhere. I mean, we could go here, but now we're going backwards, and I, I feel as though. White might be able to try something a bit clever like e6. I don't know, maybe this is quite dangerous. Takes and then, uh, I don't know, something like f6 check, or maybe we could do something like queen c3 check, bringing the queen in, something like this, and then maybe queen c7. It's a bit, it's really awkward for mm. Black, and Black's kind of lost control of the position. So after b5, he just simply took this one. Well, yes, his king's a bit weak. Um, well, a lot of the pawns got exchanged, but now black has two of these over here. What are they called? Uh, they're passed pawns, which means there's no pawn, no pawns from the opposing team to in the way to stop them. Well, white has a passed pawn as well, but black's king is actually in the perfect position to try and defend that h8 yeah. square, whereas white's king is no way near the queen side where black would like to queen down here. And you're going to see that in the game where white's king had to move all the way like this in really slow time to try and get across. So uh, do you think... Um, Black would like to exchange queens and get an end game in this position. I mean, I think I think they must do because while the, while the queens are still on the board, white must still have chances. Whereas once the queens are off, those two pawns on A and B are going to become monsters and just march down the board. Sure. That's right, and that's exactly what happened. Um, Black had to keep an eye on this H pawn, so the game's still in the balance here. Um, yeah, it's not over by any means, but no, not at so. all. Um, Bishop E three. Um, could he have gone check? He could have gone check, king g7. Um, I think he could have done this, but then maybe b3. And despite white's extra pawn, that is a pretty fast pawn, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, As you say, that black king is sort of going to slow down any pawn advance that's on right. the king's And side. the key difference is pretty much the fact that this bishop is just much worse than the knight. The right. knight does a superb job of being there, looking at all these different And as you squares. say, that, that's sort of unusual, because with lots of space on the board, you'd, you'd, you'd think that the bishop would be quite good, because it can move straight across the whole distance yeah, of the board. But, but surprisingly enough, no, not in this position. No. Um, so it seems that white's pawn, he got to h6, but he can't go any further, can he? Yeah. So, uh, queen check, king g8, and here, Carlson again could take a draw, but he's not interested, he went here. And now I think white committed the decisive mistake because he swapped queens. Um, oh, we just said, you, you couldn't really do that. Yeah. Probably he shouldn't have done that, um, I'm not quite sure of the time situation, but when he swapped, now we've got an, an actual endgame where the two pawns should be should be good enough now it, even to me this looks like um, black can't be stopped well I the think, one yeah. pawn can just easily be stopped can't sure. it whereas you these know, the, two combined with the knight should just be because the white bishop's dark square bishop it can't ever move that king off the h7 square so king f3 and now we see the white king desperately try and join the action but now um, the pawn's already quite quick um, knight a5 is quite a nice little move but basically it looks as though black's winning here the idea is to go a3 and knight b3 and just control a1 um, I think this is pretty lost already. So b3, a very nice little touch there, because if he takes... What happens now? Oh, you just march the pawn down to the bottom of the Yeah, you and can unfortunately, do. Is white can't do anything about that square. So king d3 was played, and knight c4, a lovely move again. Wow, so it looks like he can just take there. the knight, but then the pawn again... This yeah. is really clever, and really, really nice way to, to, to win. 
a3 again if king the knight's immune because if they're then b2 so g4 but i think basically white's lost here because he can't do anything on the king side g4 yeah he's... which is the king side being that side whereas that and he can't side move his king side. further away he's got to keep it relatively close that's right so king h7 g5 and again perfect play from carlson he just snuffs out any play whatsoever with this move wow. and now white can basically resign here um, the game finished with this, and now Black only needs to control the B1 square, so he played a lovely move, Knight D2. And, and again, you can't take it. Because you can't it take just... it. So here we see the power of the bishop uh, against the knight. Normally the bishop is better than the knight in an open position, but here, actually, it's the other way around. Um, the girlfriend would have to give up the bishop for the pawn, for the, for the pawns, yeah. but now the knight will mop up all of these three, and luckily for Black... Well, luckily, so I think it's more like skill. <laughs> yeah, I don't He's think it was been any left luck with it. an extra pawn, which will then Goodness. end up on F1 at some point in the future. So, excellent technique from Magnus Carlsen. That's why he's the world's best player at the moment. And uh, by winning this game, he now has two draws and the key win there. So, uh, he's hanging around the top players already. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, Lauren. That was indeed uh, a very beautiful game. And as you say, just to show why Magnus Carlsen's the uh, highest rated player in chess history. Well, thank you very much for that. We uh, hope you enjoyed the video. We'll be back to... We won't be back tomorrow because it's a rest day for the players. We'll be back on Tuesday with our game of the day from round four.